Howdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's presentation featuring Congressman Chet Edwards. I'm delighted that uh, Congressman Edwards can join us tonight and present the William Waldo Cameron Forum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Flo Creighton, who, through her generous uh, support, was able to endow this program in memory of her father. I appreciate all her support and friendship toward the Library Foundation. Unfortunately, Ms. Creighton could not be with us tonight, but I think she may be watching on the website because this program is being live streamed on our website. So, Flo, if you're watching, thank you very much. But we do have good representation from the family. We have Rick Boswick with us from Waco, who is a nephew of Flo. So, Rick, thank you for representing the family here and, and convey our appreciation to Flo. Uh, tonight, as I mentioned to you, we have our very own Congressman Chet Edwards. Uh, Chet uh, was elected to his ninth term in 2006 and represents the 17th Congressional District of Texas, which encompasses portions of North Texas, Central Texas, and the Brazos Valley. More importantly, Texas A&M is part of this district. He is one of the few House members to serve on both the House Budget and the Appropriations Committees. Chet is a recognized leader for America's veterans, uh, troops, and military families in Congress. As chairman of the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Subcommittee, he recently authored the $6.6 billion increase in the 2008 VA budget passed by the House of Representatives this year, the largest increase in the VA's 77-year history. He also serves on the Homeland Security Appropriations Subcommittee, Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, and co-chairs the Bipartisan House Army Caucus and the USO Congressional Caucus. Before going to Congress, he served in the Texas State Senate from 1983 through 1990, where he strongly supported Texas A&M funding issues. In Congress, Chet continues his contact with and support of Texas A&M. Indeed, Chet is an Aggie. He graduated from Texas A&M in 1974 with a BA in economics and earned an MBA from the Harvard Business School in 1981. Uh, Chet will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes Afterwards, you'll be happy to take questions from the audience. Those of you who would like to pose a question to the congressman can do so by using the microphones that are in the side aisles. And please keep your comments to questions, not comments. We'll be asked you that in terms of saving some time here. After the program, we do have a reception in the lobby of the building, and you're all invited to join uh, in that um, reception. Uh, congressman Edwards will be joining us in that reception, and you'll have an opportunity to continue your discussions that we're going to start here in a few minutes. And at this time, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to present to you Congressman Chet Edwards. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Howdy. Howdy. I've got to admit to you, I always love it when I get to hear the United States Secretary of Defense uh, using that great Aggie tradition to begin his speeches. And I'm so honored to be here. Uh, Ambassador Popovic, uh, thank you for your kind words, and even more importantly, thank you for your lifetime of service to our country. Uh, you truly personify the vision of former President Bush, who said that public service is a noble calling, and thank you for that service to the country. You know, when I was a, an 18-year-old senior in high school at Memorial High School in, in Houston, Texas, and went to Washington, D.C. on my first trip there, and that's the first congressman I'd, never, I'd ever met before. I uh, would have never guessed that that young second-term member of the House would uh, later become the 41st president of the United States. And I would certainly have never guessed that years later I would have the privilege of representing my alma mater and his presidential library here in College Station. And that is a, a true privilege for, for me. I would also imagine that Barbara Bush never imagined when I met her husband 37 years ago that uh, over three and a half decades later he would still be jumping out of airplanes and parachutes. <laughs> President Bush's lifetime of public service highlighted by his courageous service in World War II, and his historic leadership role in bringing down the communist walls of the Cold War and rebuilding Europe in its aftermath. 
have throughout my life been an inspiration to me. And that's why it's such a, a personal and deep honor to be part of a program sponsored by the Creighton family uh, through their gracious generosity. But to be part of a program associated with the Bush Library Foundation is, is something that I will certainly never forget. Thank you for that, for that privilege. I try not to take myself too seriously. I've done a little reading of history, and I don't know how it happened, but for 200 years before I got elected to Congress in 1990, our democracy survived. And, and I have a sneaking suspicion it will go on long after I retire, and that's the way it should be. But while I try not to take myself too seriously, I do take very seriously the institution in, in which I serve, even the United States Congress. Our founding fathers chose the Congress, not the president, not the judicial branch of our government. The power to declare war, levy taxes, which sometimes we do all too well, and appropriate the federal taxpayers' flooding money. Congress is at the heart of our democracy, and decisions made there, for better or worse, will shape the future of our nation and the world for decades to come. That's why I'd like to address tonight the issue of partisanship and the crisis of confidence in Congress. As you know, I know it's no surprise, public polls have shown that approval ratings for Congress are at an almost historic low. That perception and the realities that have led to it saddened me. Saddened me because when I look out of my office across the street from the Capitol and look at that Capitol Dome, which has been called the citadel of our democracy, perhaps the greatest symbol of freedom anywhere in the world, I know that we still live in a nation that is the best and greatest nation and the best democracy in the world. For the record, let me point out that skepticism is not a new thing to Congress. In fact, those of you that have been to our magnificent capital have probably seen Statuary Hall just outside the, the front door to the U.S. House chamber. And in that first hallway, very prestigious hallway leading right into the door to which the President goes when he gives the State of the Union address, there are about eight statues. One of those is Will Rogers of Oklahoma. And while the other statues are facing each other, Mr. Rogers' statue is facing the front door of the House of Representatives. Why? Because when the leaders of Oklahoma asked him to give them their, give him and, and everyone their permission to put his statue in that statuary hall, he said, well, you under one condition, and that is if I'm facing the House of Representatives because I want to watch over those rascals. <clears throat> Skepticism toward Congress is a healthy part of our Founding Fathers' vision of the checks and balances of government. However, I believe cynicism is not. It's not because cynicism can lead to lower voter turnout, which enhances the power of the most narrow of special interest groups. Cynicism can also lead to good people and to our youth saying no to the calling of public service. At a time when in a complex world we need the best and brightest to seek public office and public service. Cynicism can lead to the demagoguery of soundbite politics. And in all due respect to the kinky freedmen of this world, it can lead to kinky freedmen of this world running for office. Sorry about that, kinky. It would be tempting for me to say that Congress's low approval rating are just the result of a challenging, difficult war in Iraq. And while frustrations over the war are a significant factor in shaping the public's low perceptions of Congress, I believe there's a more fundamental reason for those low job approval ratings. Americans, quite frankly, are tired of what they see as too much petty partisan bickering in Washington, D.C., with justification, the public believes that partisanship is preventing Congress from addressing the day-to-day -day concerns of average working Americans. 
You know, here at A&M with my roommate, Philip Smith, who's here tonight, I was taught that the first step to solve a problem is to identify it, to understand it, and to understand its causes. And with that in mind, I'd like to share with you for a few moments my thoughts about the causes of the high level of partisanship we see in Washington. Now, in fairness, let me say this. There, there is probably much more bipartisanship in Congress than the American public would witness. Now, why do I say that? On a typical Wednesday, we might pass eight bills into law, or at least pass eight bills through the House. On seven of those, we can work together on a bipartisan basis that you would want us to do, seeking common ground. And there's very little press attention to that. But let us get to the eighth bill. And out of 435 House members, two or three or four come to the floor and start a verbal shouting match with each other. All of a sudden, on the floor above us, the press gallery doors open up, and the reporters come come to those doors to cover that debate. And guess what you see on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and the talk shows that night? It's not the seven bills where we work together in good faith. It's the one where a handful of members went to the floor and screamed at each other. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Earlier this year, uh, I had the, the privilege of offering and passing through the House the largest increase in veterans' health care funding in the 77-year history of the Veterans Administration. As chairman of that committee, I worked very, very closely from day one with my Republican colleagues. And the end result was that we passed my bill, my bill by a vote of 409 in favor and two against. Still trying to figure out who those two were, but not, not a bad bipartisan vote, 409 to two. But you know what? That bill's passage, as significant as it was and as important as our veterans are and as vital as it is for us to carry out our moral responsibility to support those who've sacrificed for your family and the American family. The national news organizations didn't give any coverage of that bill. It's not conflict. It's not news. While there is more bipartisanship in Congress than is reported to the public, let me be clear of my own views. There is far too much partisan bickering in Washington, far too much one-upmanship. It's much worse than when I worked for Congressman Teague, a m class of 32. Some of you knew Mr. Teague. When I graduated from A&M in 1974. In fact, the day that Philip and I walked across the stage at our commencement, Mr. Teague, a Democrat, had invited then Vice President Gerald Ford, a Republican, to be our commencement speaker. And the Vice President accepted that, that invitation. I would have to be creative to imagine these days Democratic members of Congress inviting Vice President Cheney to come speak at their university's commencement, or the vice president wanting to accept such an invitation. In the 1980s, President Reagan and liberal Democrat from Massachusetts, Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House, would spend all day long verbally battling positions on national issues. But at the end of the day, President Reagan would often send a note to Tip, inviting him to come to the White House to have drinks to show that respect that went beyond the differences, honest differences on issues. How much better off we'd be today if we had those kind of personal relationships. In my opinion, there are several reasons for the increase in partisanship in Congress these days. First, the reality is that our country is almost evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans, social conservatives, and, and progressives. Thus, many of the divisions in Congress simply reflects political divisions across the country. Second, many state legislatures have an interesting marriage of political convenience. For incumbents in both parties made far too many congressional districts either 70% Republican or 70% Democratic. It's pretty well for the incumbents. Democrat says, I'll give you some of my Republican communities and you give me some of your Democratic communities and vice versa. It serves the interest the selfish interest of those two incumbents from both parties, but not the interest of our country. There are too few districts 
such as the one that I represent, that are truly competitive districts. And, and this is the consequence of having too few competitive districts. When we have tough votes on, on major issues, incumbents have little political incentive to reach out across party lines to find common, common ground for the good of our country. Why? Because these members that come from a 70, 80, or 90 percent Republican or Democratic district, respectively, are more worried about a primary opponent than the next election rather than a general election opponent. Thus, it, it is so hard to find common ground on important where we should, such as children's health insurance, energy, the budget, war in Iraq, just to mention a few. The third reason, in my opinion, for the harsh edge of partisanship in Congress is that overly negative campaigns, backed by millions of dollars in contributions, demonize candidates in 30-second attack ads. And by the way, uh, my predecessor, two members of Congress before, Bob Pogue from the Waco area, spent $2,000 in his first winning race for Congress. Uh, I've spent $3 million in each of my last two winning races for Congress. Uh, I wish it weren't so. But, by the way, when I talk about harsh campaigns creating partisan feelings and divides, I, I should add some historical perspective here. The fact is that political campaigns have always been a contact sport in America. In fact, in the presidential campaign of 18 between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, those two great founding fathers said things about each other that literally you could not legally print in today's battalion or, or eagle. <clears throat> Nevertheless, today having political venom fill out 24 hours a day on radio and TV talk shows and in campaign commercials isn't good for our democracy, and frankly it sets a terrible example for our children and youth, the leaders of tomorrow's democracy. I don't know a simple answer to this. Let me give you an example. In my race in 2004, it was a major race, as many of you know, with, with State Representative Arlene Wilgamuth after redistricting. And after the race had heated up sometime in mid to late September before the November election, I made a decision. I told my pollster and I told my media advisors that I'm tired and I think my constituents are tired of all the, the attack ads back and forth. So I made a decision to run two positive ads uh, that last week of September and didn't even mention my opponent's name. During that si same time period, Mrs. Wogamuth made the decision to run two negative ads uh, attacking me. You know what happened? In an eight-month campaign, that was the only week, the only week where my poll numbers actually dropped. Guess what kind of ads I ran the next week? Two ads raising questions about her voting record, and my poll numbers went back up. We candidates have to take responsibility for that. But voters also somehow have to find a way to break the cycle in just one election year. If we could do that, then the next election year, campaign managers all across America would be falling all over themselves be running positive campaigns. If any of you find an answer to this problem, please call me Kohak. While pointing out differences on issues is certainly fair, I would at least hope that voters would demand that negative ads focus on facts and records, not character assassinations. And I wish that advertisers would sometimes think about pulling their advertising from television and radio talk shows where those hosts, right or left, doesn't matter to me, spill venom day after day after day, poisoning the, the democracy in which we live, the democracy that requires respect for those with whom we, we disagree. The negative nature of campaigns doesn't just fuel partisanship. It creates cynicism about our democracy and about its elected officials. Imagine, if you would, for a moment, Let's say on television, American Airlines ran an ad and said continental mechanics have been found to have serious drug problems. And then to counterattack, Continental Airways ran television ads saying, well, you know, American Airlines has had pilots with drinking problems. Would you want to fly commercial airliners? No. 
So it should be no surprise that after these long campaign seasons of attack ads, we have many Americans who are cynical about our political process. The fourth reason for unbridled partisanship is, ironically, that most members of Congress now raise their families in their home states. And I think it's good that we spend a maximum amount of time in our, in our home states and districts. But before jet airplanes, most members of Congress raised their children in Washington. And one positive thing came from that. Members that went to churches together and had children in school together and Boy Scouts together got to know each other. And that's happened with me, for example. Leanne and I have made the decision, made it about eight years ago, that no job was worth my spending five days a week away from my children that are now 10 and 12 and her, and two days or three days a week with them. So we moved our children to Virginia, even as we have a second home and, and, and our primary home and our residence in, in Waco. But what's happened, Jim McCrary, top Republican on the Ways and Means Committee, very powerful position in Congress. Our kids go to Pinewood Derby together. We go to scout meetings on Monday night together. Uh, our children go to the same school together. We babysat for their children, and they've done so for our there is no way, no matter what the difference of opinion might be on, a, on an issue of the day, that Jim McCrary and I would ever go to the floor and, and let venom spew from our voices. If we had a difference on an important issue, it would be expressed in a respectful manner. And if we had those kind of relationships more today, as we did, in Mr. Teague say, in years past, uh, I think we'd all be better off. The fifth, part of, fifth, fifth reason why I think we have so much partisanship and Congress is that recent speakers, at least those with whom I've been associated, seem to have had the, the attitude that a bill will not be allowed on the floor of the House unless it can basically be passed by a majority of votes from their own party. Speaker Wright, Speaker Foley, Speaker Gendrick, Speaker Hastert, Speaker Pelosi, all have, have tended to share that philosophy. Somehow we need to, to change that. Because this is what happens. When you try to pass bills through the House, overwhelmingly on just votes from your own party, you end up locking out input from the minority party. And it's just human nature. If you're locked out from having genuine, meaningful input into the legislative process, you have no incentive to cooperate. You're going to be a bomb thrower. And that's what's happened when both Republican and Democratic party voices have been locked out in the political process in, in Congress. Fortunately, I would not predict it with presidential season among us, that hard-edged partisanship will end this year or, or next. But I do hope that both presidential nominees from both parties, whomever they will be, will respond to the public outrage over partisanship by making strong commitments to seek common ground. It won't be easy, but their leadership can make a difference. To seek common ground, to end the cynicism creating partisanship in our nation's capital. And those of us in Congress need to reach out whenever we can across the aisle. And I'm proud to tell you as fellow Texans that the Texas delegation, after years of some hard-edged feelings over some rough redistricting, our delegation is now reaching out and working together on a number of issues and meeting on a regular basis. I hope that approach will spread to the rest of, of Congress. Reducing partisanship and returning respect in political debate is important for two reasons. First, Public disdain for excessive partisanship, if left unchecked, I believe will lead to even more cynicism toward our political system. And that cynicism can undermine the trust that is so necessary to make our democracy work, as it should. Second, think about the enormous challenges our nation faces today. Winning the war on terrorism. Reducing a $9 trillion national debt that's getting bigger every day. Addressing the baby boom impact on entitlement programs such as Medicare and Social Security, addressing the dire consequences of having 47 million Americans, many of them working, not having health insurance at all, and developing a long-term energy policy so we can lessen our dependence upon OPEC oil. In my 17 years in Congress, I've found that one of the most difficult problems is to get legislators to make decisions that require short-term sacrifice for long-term gain. Long term in D.C. is often defined as when is the next election. Thus, addressing our nation's long term problems will be difficult enough as it is. But to do so without good faith compromise and genuine bipartisanship 
would be nearly impossible. American history has proved time and time again the writing and passage of our Constitution, the conduct of war, the passage of civil rights laws, that finding solutions to major national challenges requires good faith compromise and cooperation. Compromise shouldn't be a four-letter word. The fact that we have the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate today is itself the result of a compromise of our founding fathers from sparsely versus heavily populated states. We live in a far more complex world than ever before. And the truth is that neither political party has a monopoly on virtue or knowledge. Neither political party has the ability or will to make the tough decisions on a unilateral basis to balance our budget while addressing the public demand for quality education, affordable, accessible health care, and improved transportation infrastructure. Addressing these major challenges will require bipartisanship at its best. I would suggest that if former Presidents Bush and Clinton can work together for the good of our country and for causes important to our world, then the United States Congress and future administrations should be willing to do the same. Wouldn't we all be the better for it? Let me finish with a personal observation, if I could, about our political process. Someone once said that there are two things you shouldn't watch being made in this world. Sausage and law. I, I think he was right. The political process especially if viewed under the microscope of 24-hour news programs hungry for conflict, is not a pretty one. At the same time, it was Winston Churchill who said this, Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. And how right Mr. Churchill was. Despite all its flaws, all of its flaws, I believe that America still has the greatest democracy in the world. It is led by fallible humans in an imperfect process. However, our founding fathers in drafting the Constitution and Bill of Rights built a magnificent system of government. Governance. They fully recognized the lesson of history, that few people could handle great power without ultimately abusing it. And that's exactly why they built an intricate system of checks and balances, with its foundation being the principle of majority rule, tempered by minority rights. To the cynics about America, I would say this. In my years in Congress, not a week has gone by where someone hasn't come into my office asking for help to become an American citizen. And in all nine of my terms, over 17 and a half years, not once have I ever had one individual come into any of my district offices asking for my help to have them renounce their American citizenship. That says something about our country, doesn't it? To those who say we no longer have what it takes, I would say you should have been with me at Mary Branch Elementary School in Bryan today to be with my friend Aaron Binger, the bravest, most inspiring person I've ever known in my life. A little 10-year-old girl facing a challenging case of cancer I met several years ago, which is she was coming to Washington to help other children with cancer by lobbying for a bill to increase federal funding for children's cancer research. To those who are cynical about America and our future and future generations here, I'd say, I wish you could have been with me three years ago on Thanksgiving morning when my wife and little boys and I went to Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital in Washington to pay our respect to the troops. And as we stood there by the bedside of a 20-year-old Army soldier, one year out of high school, who had lost a leg and serviced our country in Baghdad, with his mother at his side as we were talking, he said, Sir, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I'm proud to serve my country, and I'd be proud to serve it again. Every day, I have the honor of seeing the cornerstone of our democracy, our community where teachers, volunteers, philanthropists, and everyday citizens are putting their faith in practice by 
quietly making a difference for their fellow citizens. Without fanfare or public acclaim, they are being their brother's keepers, making a difference for others, doing the right thing for the right reason. Someday, I'm going to write a book called What I Learned About America from D.C. Taxi Cab Drivers. Let, let me explain that. For years, my first seven or eight years in Congress, I went up there and when I arrived at Reagan National Airport, I'd get in the cab and the taxi cab driver would speak such heavily accent in English. I don't know if it's their English or my Texas English, but <clears throat> I got dropped off in places I never intended to visit in Washington, D.C. And frustration, I decided to learn something from these, these citizens. And, and so I started asking them every time I got in the cab, where are you from? Why did you come here? And about eight or nine years ago, 11 o'clock at night, late at night after I'd been back home here in Texas, I got in the cab and he spoke with very heavy accents. I said, where, sir, where are you from? And he was from a country halfway around, around the world. I said, well, how long have you been here? And he said, well, I came here 20 years ago. And I said, would you have children? He said, yes, I have three children and I have a wife. And, and I said, well, did they come with you? I assume they came with you 20 years ago. And he said, no. He said, uh, they came here three years ago. And as a father of two little young boys, uh, I had to catch my breath a moment. I said, wait a minute, how did that work? He said, well, this is the way it worked. He said, for, for 17 years, I came to your country for 10 months out of every 12. And I worked minimum wage jobs, sometimes two and three jobs at a time save up just a little bit of money for my family's future nest egg and, and enough money to buy a ticket back home to be with my family for two months every year. I said, you did that for 17 years? And he said, yes, sir. And I said, you could honestly put $5 million in the back seat of your taxi cab right now and ask me to do that for only the next two or three years, and it wouldn't be a temptation, not even a temptation. I said, why did you do it? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, I have a hope and a dream and a prayer. I had a hope, a dream, and a prayer that someday I might have the chance to raise my children in a country. But they could have just two things. Religious freedom and the opportunity to be whatever they wanted to be in life. And he said, now my children are here and they're American citizens. I'm an American citizen. And he said, my two sons are studying to be engineers and my daughter's going to be a physician. Say what is good about our country. What the the brilliance of our democracy lies not in its perfection, but in its resilience, its ability to correct course in a never-ending quest to bring the dream of liberty and justice for all, and opportunity for all, to reality for all. I believe the real strength of our democracy was perhaps best stated by Alexander Hamilton in a quotation that now is in a prominent place on the first floor of the Capitol. We observed, here, sir, the people govern. Here, sir, the people govern. Our founding fathers understood that the citizens of our nation, not our political leaders, would be the ultimate check and balance in our democracy. And two centuries later, I cherish the wisdom of our founding fathers. And I share their optimism about the future of these United States. We are a great nation and a good nation. And woe to anyone who, under, who underestimates the resilience or the resolve of our land of the free and home of the brave. May God continue to bless the land, the land that we love. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Congressman for his very informative and thought-provoking um, presentation tonight. We have time for a few questions yet, so those of you in the audience who would like to pose a question, please make use of the microphone. Yes, sir. The question is, if I can have 30 seconds to meet you and give you the documents about the veteran project that I'm working for the World War II Museum and the Iraqi War. 
anything that you are doing in behalf of veterans, uh, you can have all the time you want, sir, whether it's tonight or in, in the weeks ahead. Um, I, I would be... Um, <laughs> I will look forward to that. I would not be in Congress today if it weren't for three people. Sarah and John Lindsay. Sarah's here. Two people have inspired me and in their love of A&M. So I was a freshman at A&M 37 years ago in Tiger Teague. Uh, their friend, they introduced me to Mr. Teague, who opened that door for me to run for office. And Mr. Teague asked me to make one promise to him when he encouraged me to run for office when I was 26 years old and looked like I was about 16 years old. And that was, if I ever got elected, Chet, please don't forget our veterans. Well, thank you for your service. And, and I'm going to try to keep my promise to Mr. Teague to take care of our veterans and stand up for our veterans. And, and I'd be honored to meet with you to talk about that. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that one of the two things the D.C. cab driver really treasured in the United States was freedom of religion. At the present time, with the kind of atmosphere we have in this country, do you think that that is in danger at all? And would you, what would you do to assure that freedom of religion continues? I probably, it would be fair to say, have been a leader in the House in trying to protect uh, religious liberty in America. I've been honored by the Baptist Joint Committee and a number of religious organizations uh, for that. I, I, I believe that our model of religious freedom in America, if our democracy ended today, would perhaps be the greatest single contribution to the world from our 200-year experiment in democracy. And our founding fathers had the wisdom to put a fundamental principle, to embed it into the, not just to the Bill of Rights, not just into the First Amendment, but into the first 16 words of the Bill of Rights. So they said, Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Something Thomas Jefferson called in 1802 in his letter to the Danbury Baptist, uh, the separation of law the separation, the wall of separation between church and, and state. I think a lot of people today misunderstand what church-state separation is all about. To me, it doesn't mean keeping people faith, of faith out of government, but it does and it should mean and it must always mean keeping government out of our, our faith. Um, I think religious freedom in America is strong today. And as a result, we have more vital religious faith in America than perhaps any nation I am aware of. And we have religious tolerance. Well, there may be differences in America. We're not killing each other over religious differences. And we did it differently. Our, our European forefathers married church and state. And I will tell you, my lesson of, of time in office is that if you allow us politicians to get our hands on, on through the political process, on the power of religion, we will end up religion as a means to win. And as a person of faith, I consider that sacrilegious. So I am going to continue to stand up for the high principle and set it in the Bill of Rights, the separation of church and state, because that is our ultimate guarantee of religious liberty. And we're the, we're the envy of the world, and we should not change that. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Congressman, thank you very much for your insightful discussion of politics in America and uh, the honest uh, account of how you see things uh, and also the practice that you've exhibited over the years of bipartisan workings in resolving our problems. I, uh, I'm glad to see you again, and I want to ask you a question that I, I think it's very close to your concerns under the security of this country in the future in a nuclear environment. We often tend to look at things that may represent trees in the forest but overlook the forest and we don't want to let that happen in today's world. There are nuclear threats out there and uh, some more important than others, but uh, I think uh, recalling the admonition that we got from Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address to the nation, 
about the importance of guarding against the increasing control of the what he referred to as the military industrial complex in the conduct of the nation's affairs. There has been some discussion, but not debate. Some developments taken in the background over a shadowed by the presidential debate this, uh, these days. But some of the discussion, including the United States Congress, the Senate in particular, deals with the fact that uh, there may be, in the views of some, and I share that concern, that a new Cold War looms on the horizon as the Bush administration plans to deploy missile defense systems in Eastern Europe to ostensibly defend Europe against Iranian missiles. Well, the Russians don't see it that way. As a matter of fact, they consider this a direct threat to their <laughs> nuclear <laughs> deterrent <laughs> system <laughs> in their bush we, phase. We need to get to the question because we have other people, so if you could ask the yes, question. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, not as a protection of Europe against Iranian missiles in the incoming or re-entry phase. My question is, do you agree with his deployment, and if so, why? If not, why not? Thank you. Okay. Um, directly to the question, I, I haven't taken a final position because I think it's such a serious issue. I don't mind telling you I want to do a lot more homework on that issue before I do take a position. Uh, because I agree with President Bush, something he said uh, in his last campaign, and that is the greatest single national security threat to the United States is the threat of, of nuclear terrorism. And so any issue that deals with defending the American family from the threat of nuclear terrorism is something I want to I want to look at seriously. I do think we have to be very cautious and working with the Russians must be respectful of, of some of their concerns and see if there is an opportunity to uh, resolve this issue without reigniting the Cold War, or something else that could be very dangerous to our interests. We have worked for over a decade with the Nunn-Luger program. This is a program that's funded in a subcommittee in which I sit, where Russia and the United States have worked together to take massive amounts of, of highly enriched uranium, any grapefruit-sized quantity of which could be used to build a nuclear bomb that would kill more Americans in one second than we've lost in every war. The Revolutionary War to World War One, World War Two, and today's war in Iraq. Because of that cooperative effort with Russia, we have been able to, to take tons of, literally tons of highly enriched uranium out of the marketplace from which terrorists could try to steal it. And we know for a fact terrorists have, on over a dozen occasions, been able to really steal highly enriched uranium out of Russia. Those are cases we know about because the Russian government found that material and, and brought it back. I worry about those other cases they haven't told us about. So anything that would jeopardize that cooperative effort under the non luger program, I would be very, very concerned about. But um, I think we'll have to work with our European allies and with Russia and, and, and ask me that question in a few months and see if I've done my, my further homework on it, and I'll try to give you a yes or no answer. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, a couple of months ago, I took a trip to Washington, D.C., and I was fortunate enough to show a house and see you in action, and it was really something. And uh, with the recent House session, which bill do you feel like was passed most effectively, the one that you're proud of? And uh, which bill do you feel like uh, could have done well for the American people that wasn't? I think the one I'm proudest of uh, was the bill I offered where we worked on a bipartisan basis that I referenced earlier that passed 409 to 2 to provide dramatic uh, and, and much-deserved increases in quality of health care for America's veterans, from World War II veterans to veterans coming back from the Iraq and, and Afghan wars. I think we handled that bill through the House process in the bipartisan sort of way that, that should be the model for the way Congress works. I think the issue that has been uh, 
most badly handled has been the children's health insurance program. I believe deeply in it. I want to expand it. I want children of working families to have health care. I think that's pro-family, pro-work. It encourages people to, to keep their job, not go back on welfare, because they can provide health care for their children and their welfare. But many of these families make just a little too much to get Medicaid health care benefits for their families, but not enough to pay 500 to $800 a month for health insurance. And I, uh, I disagree with some of my uh, Republican colleagues on the position on the bill, but I think the Democratic leadership passed up an opportunity to work with some of the, the moderate Republicans. Uh, as had happened in the, in the Senate, where some very conservative Republican senators, such as Senator Grassley and Senator Hatch, were, were co-sponsors of this legislation. I hope when we come back in December and January, for the good of the children, the four million children who could benefit from this new health coverage, we can find a way to work together. Thank, thank you. And, Come back to Washington uh, again. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, uh, on the lines of bipartisanship, it seems to me that uh, sometimes you see the strongest forms of bipartisanship on the biggest and most important issues. And I know in the future, one of your biggest challenges will be when they start to reshape health care. And I was wondering, uh, once all the debates start coming up about universal health care, uh, where do you stand and what do you think the uh, overall solution is? And uh, are you for or against universal health care? It, it's a wonderful goal, and I can't imagine anyone not wanting uh, to have that as a goal. But the challenge becomes how do we get to that goal and how do we pay for, for universal health care? What I do not support is a government-run, government-mandated, government-managed health care system. I think in that we lose the vitality in the, 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 the cutting-edge research and that just that extra vigor we have as a result of our private health care system. What I hope somehow is that we could find a way to continue our public-private health care system in a way that could expand uh, health care insurance employers. I, I think, for example, uh, allowing employers to band together, such as small realtors that might have to pay $1,000 a month on their own for health insurance, but if they could be part of a health care plan with 10,000 other real estate brokers around America, maybe they could pay $500 a, a month. Uh, ultimately, I, I think everything we do with health care is just putting band-aids on the problem until we figure out how to deal with the 47 million Americans that today don't have health insurance and probably the 48, 49, or 50 million Americans who won't have it a year or two now because of the escalating cost of, of health care. There may come a time, I, I don't favor passing a, a law mandating every employer providing health care insurance for the employees unless we can combine with that uh, a tax incentive to give them a tax credit or tax deduction to help uh, ease that financial burden. I don't want to put millions of small businesses to work by a well-intended mandated health care plan. But that is a perfect example of where the neither political party can extend the political capital to unilaterally pass a health care plan that addresses the needs of 47 million Americans that don't, don't have health care today. And that's why I think it's so vital that we change the process and, and the tone of the debate and respect in Congress so that we can address these, these issues. And that's exactly why tonight I chose to speak not so much on one or two or three issues, because all of these energy, health care, rock, all these other issues are so important, but in my judgment, I wanted to talk about the process of bringing back bipartisanship, because until we change the process, there is no hope, no hope for major health care reform in America. If we can't even pass a children's health insurance bill because of partisanship, there's no way we can expand our uh, our coverage to the 47 million, million Americans who don't have it. The one thing I will say that I am going to support, because the best little lobbyist in America is sitting right down here on the front row, Aaron Binger, and that is a bill to increase the National Institutes of Health research budget for children's cancer research. Uh, that is something I know I support, and Aaron, uh, with your help, we're going to Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Howdy, how you doing, sir? Howdy. It's been great. Um, I was just wondering if you could step back into the shoes of the student for a second, and um, you spoke a lot about the venomous sitting back and forth. And I was wondering just what kind of advice you have for my generation to at least work on that and try to come back together with the relationship that you speak of. I would ask your generation to change my generation into recognizing that democracy is all about respecting people who have different opinions and uh, to, to practice, uh, to, to put that that high principle into, into practice every day is your is you're working with your fellow students, whether it's through the Corps of Cadets or through the Memorial Student Center. When you have a difference with a student, uh, don't demonize them for that difference. Or if you hear others demonizing someone for their political view or personal view on an issue, uh, don't let them get away with that. Uh, uh, we just shouldn't glorify those who, who would literally attack the, the, the character of an individual because he or she has a different viewpoint. Every morning when I drive into the Capitol, when we're in session in Washington, I purposely drive by Arlington National Cemetery. And I look over my right shoulder every morning on that drive to look at those tombstones to remind me that these great Americans gave their careers and many gave their lives so that we can live in a democracy and express different viewpoints without hating each other. And so... My request to your generation is do a better job than my generation has done in reminding us that democracy requires respect. And uh, again, can you think of a better model than former President Bush, who was defeated by President Clinton and yet reached out because he realized that them working together on a bipartisan basis could help solve problems all across the world? Uh, Every time we think of this issue, we ought to think about President Bush and, and President Clinton and how they have provided a model for us. And maybe your generation can change things for the better as well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Hi, Congressman. Hi. Um, my question has to do with uh, young people who happen to be uh, undocumented aliens, uh, young people who have completed uh, our K-12 educational system, some enrolling in colleges and universities, um, many working in our community, um, getting back and supporting those efforts. Um, many of them are having difficulty obtaining citizenship. It's really beyond their means in many ways. Um, what's your thoughts of trying to help facilitate these young people who have been in our country, have been educated in our country, who are working in our country, to, to going through the oftentimes challenging and difficult um, uh, process of becoming citizens of our country. I know this is a very emotional and, and heartfelt issue, people on both sides. I sit on the appropriation subcommittee that funds our Border Patrol, and I've been part of the effort to double the number of Border Patrol agents over the last four or five years. And we're going to do more with technology, more Border Patrol agents. We we do have an important responsibility to enforce and protect our, our borders and our, and our immigration laws. And we have not protected our borders well. The government has failed at that effort. Um, we have not enforced our immigration laws, and we have to start enforcing them. Uh, having said that, my attitude has been you, you don't punish five-year-old children or seven-year-old children for the decisions their, their parents made. And so I'm glad that the United, Supreme, United States Supreme Court has said that as long as a, a young child is in this country, we Americans would rather have that child in school learning and learning how to be a good, good neighbor and a productive citizen someday rather than out on the streets, perhaps encouraging them to, to get into drugs. So when, when we have situations where somebody perhaps had their parents bring them here when they were two years old, so they're not an American citizen, but they've been in our public schools because that's the law of the land in our country has said that's the right thing to do, then I think we need to find some way not to punish them. I don't want to send a green light to illegal immigrants to come into this country. We can't allow the free flow across our borders. We can't afford it. 
economically in our health care system, in our education system, and it certainly would not uh, be consistent with our need to defend America against potential terrorism. We must strengthen our borders and stop the illegal immigration flow. But for those who have been here for a long time, uh, I hope we could find a way to look into our personal values and our country's values and say, do we want to punish a young child who's done well uh, because the parent's uh, decision made five years ago, ten years ago, or, or 20 years ago? And I say that with all due respect, knowing that there will be others who would disagree with me. But isn't that what we've been talking about tonight? We can disagree without shooting each other. And thank, thank you for the question you raised. This will have to be our last question, Kevin. Okay. Congressman Elkwitz, uh, in the wake of uh, Jena 6 and other racist attacks across America, do you think that the, or do you feel personally, that the federal government should step in now to redefine what a hate crime really is? I have voted for hate crime legislation because I think there is a difference between a 16-year-old writing seniors class of 2008 on a bridge and uh, a young neo-Nazi going to a synagogue and painting a swastika on, on that. I think we're a country that is at its very best when people respect our diversity and respect people from all races and, and all religions. And we're at our worst when we have those few who would draw a, an artificial dividing line between Americans based on race or, or religion. So for that uh, I have voted for and will continue to support hate crimes legislation. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for tonight. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us. Congressman, once again, thank you for joining us and being with us here tonight. Um, thank you. And Gigan, thank you very much.